This episode is brought to you by Vital Farms. Isn't it bullshit to have to question where your food comes from? At Vital Farms, you can trace your pasture-raised eggs all the way back to the source, the pasture. On the side of each pasture-raised carton of eggs, you'll find the name of the farm where your eggs were laid. And when you look the farm up on their website, you'll get a peek at all the sunshine, fresh air, and open space the hens enjoy. Learn more and find out where to buy them at vitalfarms.com. Vital Farms, keeping it bullshit free. I'm Jason Palmer, one of the hosts of The Intelligence, The Economist's daily current affairs podcast. The Economist's award-winning shows make sense of what matters, from our special series on China's president to our weekly podcasts on business, technology, and American politics. Our journalists provide fair, in-depth reporting on the events shaping the world. Search for Economist Podcasts Plus and sign up to our free one-month trial. This episode is brought to you by Clavio, the platform that powers smarter digital relationships. With Clavio, you can activate all your customer data in real time. Connect seamlessly with your customers across all channels. Guide your marketing strategy with AI-powered insights, recommendations, and automated assistance. Deliver experiences that feel individually designed at scale and grow your business faster. Power smarter digital relationships with Clavio. Learn more at clavio.com/spotify. That's k-l-a-v-i-y-o.com/spotify. Reboot your credit card with Apple Card, the credit card created by Apple. It gives you unlimited daily cash back that you can now choose to grow in a high yield savings account that's built right into the Wallet app. Apply for Apple Card now in the Wallet app on iPhone and start growing your daily cash with savings today. Apple Card subject to credit approval. Savings is available to Apple Card owners subject to eligibility requirements. Savings accounts provided by Goldman Sachs Bank USA. Member FDIC. Terms apply. It's time to say goodbye to hold music and say hello to fast customer support with Service Cloud. With trusted AI and data working together, you can skip long wait times and deliver efficient, personalized service right away. All while keeping support costs low and more customers happy. Reimagine your customer support with the number one AI CRM for service. Learn what's possible at Salesforce.com/products/service. Welcome to the Human Capital Innovations Podcast, where your source for personal, professional, and organizational growth and development. Where we share original research, explore industry trends, and interview executives and thought leaders from across the globe. We hope you join us often for practitioner-oriented content around all things related to leadership, HR, talent management, organizational development, and change management. Maximize your personal and organizational potential with Human Capital Innovations podcast. Do you enjoy the Human Capital Innovations podcast? Please subscribe, leave a review, comment, share, and consider supporting the podcast on Patreon, even at the producer and sponsorship levels. Welcome to the Human Capital Innovations Podcast. In this HCI podcast episode, I talk with Chase Garbarino about how the role of HR manager has changed with the shift to a hybrid work culture. Chase Garbarino, welcome to the Human Capital Innovations Podcast. John, thanks so much for having me. Yeah, it's a pleasure to be with you. You're joining us from the Boston area. I'm south of Salt Lake City in Utah. And today we're going to be talking about the changing nature and role of the HR manager and how HR needs to be responding to the shifting nature of work, especially in more hybrid and remote work cultures. As we get started, I wanted to share Chase's bio with everybody. Chase Garbarino is a co-founder and CEO of HQO. Previously, Chase was the co-founder and CEO of American Inno, where he helped build a local media network for, for the innovation economies in over a dozen U.S. cities. In 2012, the company was purchased by ACBJ, a subsidiary of Advanced Publications. Chase is an avid Boston sports fan and runner, as well as a washed-up college basketball player. He enjoys spending non-work time with his wife and sons. He holds a BA from Hamilton College. Uh, and where did you play college ball? I was at uh, Hamilton when I played. It's a little D3 school in upstate New York. Sweet. 
-hmm. You know, my experience in playing with college players on a few occasions is even the worst among them are heads and shoulders above anywhere I will ever be. So (laughs) that might have been the case for me at one point, but uh, I was playing in a men's league not long ago and I we got run off the court by a bunch of 18 year olds in college. So we were we aren't what we once were. (laughs) Yeah. And I have to remind myself because mentally I'm still like early 20s, you know, (laughs) in terms of my physical abilities, but I'm I'm now early to mid forties. And so (laughs) it it doesn't actually work out that way when I'm actually Um, trying to push, push myself. It's tough. It's tough when that reality sets in. I'm, I'm 37. It just, it hit me that the, the basketball game changed uh, where now I'm kind of backing the ball at the court a lot more than I used to preserving. (laughs) (laughs) That's right. Well, we're not going to talk about basketball, but, uh, but it's fun to, to learn that little tidbit about you. And, and uh, it's, it's great to have a chance to chat with you. As we get started, uh, is there anything else you would like to share with listeners about your background, your personal context, anything about your story before we launch on into the conversation? No, I mean, I think the the kind of theme of uh, my co-founders and I, like we've been working together for a little over 15 years, the, the things that we built are all very different industries and businesses. Obviously, they're all technology, but the kind of theme has been this like local Um, community aspect. So American Inno is very much about um, helping bolster innovation economies outside of the Bay Area. So it's now um, kind of local community platforms to really drive innovation in, you know, all markets. We, when we got out of college in 2007, obviously we're heading into the financial recession and um, the financial crisis. and we we're saying, you know, what's going to happen is entrepreneurs are going to pull us out of this. And how do you kind of bring people together and develop skills and learning in a way that the rising tide lifts all boats and kind of local communities, which I think is where our conversation today is going to be so relevant for HR managers in terms of, you know, uh, what what their job um, needs to look like and be successful. And obviously how we've transitioned into HQO has been really centered around kind of the physical workplace enabling um, ultimately great employee experience and the the physical workplace is lots of different places. It's not just the office, but there is kind of a common theme. If somebody were were to look at American Inno and HKO, they probably think they're very different, but we've been pretty obsessive about how local kind of community can drive economic progress, which we think is just a, a very worthy cause. Yeah, that's fantastic. So let's start at like the 80,000 foot view here and talk about leaders generally Mm -hmm. in this remote world, this hybrid world. uh, Clearly over the last couple of years, organizations and leaders have had to grapple with the harsh reality that whether you like it or not, you're going to have to learn how to do remote successfully. And and as COVID started to subside and people became more um, uh, vaccinated and safe and, and just not as concerned about health risks and concerns, more people started to return to work, uh, but the genie was out of the bottle. People didn't want to fully come back, and that's that's where all the conversation around hybrid work was really born. No, it's it's not new. Uh, p- people have had hybrid work arrangements for for decades. They've had remote work arrangements for decades, um, but given the, the last couple of years, we've just been accelerated into that kind of new reality. And there's just better technologies now than there were even a decade ago to, to facilitate it. But mm-hmm. with all of that, one of the reasons why many leaders have been trying to push their people back into the physical office is because they're not sure what to do about culture, um, team building, onboarding, like some of those types of things that traditionally have been done person to person. And they're not sure how to do it. Uh, and, you know, establish and maintain and sustain a healthy workplace culture when people are scattered and distributed all over the place, who knows where they are, right? And so what are those biggest challenges and how can, how can leaders generally start to face those as, you know, we're, we're now thankfully coming out of the pandemic um, and, and we're starting to, to ease into a new kind of a normal situation. Uh, what, what are those challenges and how can we address them? Yeah, I mean, I think I think what we're seeing is, and everyone talks about this, right? Like, how do you return people to office? And I think it's the wrong question, right? Like, returning to office is kind of putting one foot in front of the other and 
going back to the office. And I think where what people are grappling with is much more a leadership question than it is about physically commuting back to the office, right? Like everybody knows how to go back to the office. It's not like that has been dramatically changed. I think what has dramatically changed is um, we had this very, you know, unfortunate set of circumstances, obviously, you know, the, the pandemic, everything about it was very unfortunate. Um, but we had this kind of black swan event that ushered in a, if we were to test the value of the physical workplace, how do you do that? Well, you need a massive control group, not working in the physical workplace. Right. And so for a very long time, um, I think both real estate and HR folks, it was like, when you ask them about, you know, how do you measure the value of this expense, which is number two to people, people is number one. And then real estate oftentimes is number two on your P and L um, in terms of dollars spent, I don't know, you just need an office, right? Like there, there wasn't sophisticated metrics around how it really impacts people, right? Unless you are literally a storage space, the only reason that the real estate, the physical real estate of the workplace is valuable is that it serves people. So we've had this fascinating kind of scrutiny on, well, what is the value of the physical workplace? And I think what we're seeing is, you kind of get these anecdotes on both sides, right? They're not very data-driven where on one side, you have a certain uh, set of employees that are saying, well, I'm more productive because I save time commuting and I'm not bothered and I can get my work done. And then on the other side, you kind of have certain people in management leadership saying like, you know, collaboration and spontaneous interaction, right? Like those are kind of the two sides shouting at each other. And I think the, the fascinating um, opportunity in all of this is for, you know, the, the employee experience to kind of take a step back and truly map out what are the activities that not just an individual need, employee needs to do, but how we work together, right? So when we talk to our uh, clients and when we talk to our own employees, we say like, you might feel more uh, productive in a lot of ways in terms of like banging out emails and doing some of the things that you really need to do in the form of like concentration work when you're isolated. But what that lacks is the context of you're a really important person to everyone else at the company. Your work impacts other people in ways that you might not necessarily know. And what that comes down to is empathy, right? And as you know, technology makes it a lot harder to empathize with people um, when you're with them in person. And you hear it like the first time somebody goes back to a conference after, you know, being away from it from COVID, they're kind of like, oh, I kind of forgot about like, it is great to, you know, engage, but it's still all anecdotal, right? And then on the management side, we've been doing a bunch of things because Henry Ford a very long time ago said we needed to work Monday through Friday, nine to five, because that's what made a ton of sense for the assembly line. But like, that was just the way that like, there was a one size fits all model for work, which in this day and age makes no sense. And so from a data perspective, we now have the technology to quantify much more data with regards to how does the physical workplace really impact the things that are critical to HR, right? In terms of employee engagement, satisfaction, production, retention. Um, so it's still kind of the first inning of the game to use a sports analogy, but um, I think you're starting to see this collision of the, the workplace and HR really start to become data driven. Um, and I think what we're, you know, we're going to learn over the next several years is um, just how impactful our physical environment is on influencing our behavior. And we're going to be much more scientific about it than, you know, it's, it's been very much art versus science for a very long time. Yeah. Oh, I really like that perspective. And there's no doubt that uh, data analytics and assessment has been high on people's mind, um, but but many really struggle with even really understanding how to do that, right? So assuming they even know how, like what kind of data they should be collecting, they don't really know how to analyze it. And if they know how to analyze it, they don't really know how to even do anything meaningful with it. And, sure. and so there's all these hurdles to being able to, to, to gather and then understand the data to make those kind of data-driven decisions. But with continuously improving HRIS systems and and uh, and people analytics approaches and softwares uh, and just the attention that people are giving to everything you were just talking about, uh, I, th I think that's going to move the needle. And and we're not we're just not taking for granted um, 
you know, what, what we did in the past. Like we assumed all these things were necessary. And after a couple of years of this, we realized, well, I'm not sure it really was necessary. Um, mm-hmm. We really need to, to take a closer look. And so I think that's all very healthy. One thing that is for sure is many people have, uh, you know, just felt their, their lives, their careers, and the way they work disrupted over the last couple of years. And, we, you know, as evidence of this, we find ourselves in what people have called the great resignation, the great reawakening, the great reevaluation, whatever you want to call it, people taking a good hard look and saying, I'm not sure I actually want to do those things I used to do. Maybe I want to go try something else, start my own business, do gig work, go to a different company, start a different career, whatever. People are really thinking long and hard about all of that. Um, So that only adds to the complexity of the situation and the uncertainty for organizations as they're grappling to attract and retain good talent and and enter HR, HR managers, HR leaders. Uh, And and they've been leaned on heavily over the last couple of years, especially over the last year or so, uh, you know, in this space to try to figure things out on the people side to, to make sure organizations have, you know, their number one asset, the people to be able to do and accomplish what they need to do. Uh, So how do you see the role of the modern HR manager shifting in this new remote or hybrid kind of a work culture and how, you know, as those, those roles are, are shifting, what new roles are emerging? Check out my new book, The Future Leader, Creating and Transforming Next-Gen organizations. Stemming from two decades of professional experience and over 600 in-depth interviews with executives, thought leaders, and scholars from across the globe, the future leader will help you explore the ordinary, everyday actions that will help you to prepare to lead in the future of work, to respond to an uncertain future, and to produce extraordinary results for individuals, teams, and organizations. Welcome to the Human Capital Innovations Academy, courses, micro-credentials, and certificates to upskill and reskill for the future of work. All HCI Academy courses, micro-credentials, and certificates are designed, developed, and delivered by award-winning and internationally renowned scholars, educators, thought leaders, executives, and practitioners. Our courses, micro-credentials, and certificates will help you make your mark on the future of work and make an immediate impact in your organizations check out the HCI Academy and our many course offerings and certificates to upskill and reskill for the future of work. Check out our new weekly LinkedIn newsletter, Alchemizing Human Capital, exploring industry trends via original research and interviews with executives and thought leaders from across the globe. We look forward to having you join us. Yeah, well, I I think you're kind of hitting the nail on the head where for a very long time now, even before COVID, but COVID just exacerbated this trend, right? More and more uh, required skills and responsibilities are getting piled on this concept of the HR manager. And when you really take a step back and look at what your average HR manager is responsible for, you're like, man, they really need to break this into more and more roles, right? Like it is getting so complex and so much of the burden of the organization is now being put on HR, right? Like HR for 50 years was always kind of seen as like, administrative in a lot of ways and it's become strategic like the most strategic thing at you know ever across all industries more and more and it's a great thing for hr professionals because you know the the chief people officer has now been a trend for a while but when you start to think about the opportunity and the professional opportunities within the hr department there's just it's becoming so multivariate that um it's an exciting space to go into and where i'm where I think the most exciting opportunity is, is kind of on this like consumerization of employment, right? It's becoming an experience to work somewhere and talent 
expects experience. And so when you look at the most sophisticated HR departments, they truly are mapping the experience of an employee the way that Disney World maps your experience in terms of like a, as a customer at Disney World. And it's a wildly different skill set than certain other things that you need to do within HR that are not, you know, I'm not diminishing those things critical to keep the business running, but it's just this whole new kind of um, value driver where if you can really design this phenomenal life cycle of an employee, um, number one, you drive more productivity from an employee. And number two, particularly for the right kind of employees that are a fit for the company, what you end up seeing is that their satisfaction goes up and typically you're going to get retention. And the ROI on the cost of pro employee productivity and retention is as clear as day. So while it's, it's a new cost for sure, in terms of like really being kind of thoughtful about the employee experience, the ROI is there. And so I think that's like this new category when you think about like someone who's really thinking through the experience of what's it like uh, the first touch point I have as a prospect through my interview process, you know, whether I get the job or not, what's the experience in terms of how I hear back from the company to my pre onboarding to onboarding, like the sophistication around um, the employee journey is really exciting. And I just think it's a, what's really cool is when you see somebody who's really passionate about their work. And when you think about employee experience, if we have more people creating a great experience that put people in a position to be passionate about their work, that's, that's a really good thing for the world, in my opinion. Um, so that's kind of the area of HR that I'm, I'm really fascinated with. And I think there's just a ton of opportunity for both industry veterans, as well as, you know, young people trying to forge a path in HR to kind of double down and, and come in and think through the skill sets and help write the playbook on this, right? It's very much still up in the air um, and kind of forge a path uh, within the category. Yeah, yeah, I love that. And organizations have been talking about customer experience and user experience for a really long time. We're finally mm -hmm. talking more and more about the employee experience. That's super important and necessary. And you just articulated why uh, very, very well. And what still boggles my mind, though, is even in this tight labor market, even though there's so much conversation around employee experience, I see, I still see it constantly. I mean, literally all the time, I'm seeing just horrendous examples <laughs> of organizations and what they're doing or not doing. Um, that's creating a really, uh, you know, negative, if not toxic kind of employee experience. And it really does blow my mind I, because mm -hmm. some of these things that we can do to create a, a more positive employee experience are super simple. It's not rocket science. You just do some simple things and, and you're like better than, I don't know, 75% of the companies that are out there. And so uh, let's talk about what some of those things are that, that leaders generally, but HR uh, professionals specifically can do to improve the, the uh, employee experience so that they can attract and retain top talent in this really tight labor market? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, I think the easy one that ever, like it's kind of low hanging fruit because of the, just how much people talk about it in market, but let's start with the, this whole like um, return to office concept because it's, everyone's talking about it and nobody knows how to do it. Um, one, one of the things that I've seen where a lot of executive teams are falling down is that they're just having very different conversations behind closed doors than they are kind of with their employee base. Right. And, you know, you touched on it kind of at the, at the top of the podcast here, which is like, we're in a much safer place uh, than we were two years ago with regards to COVID and because of great scientific work, progress should continue there, which is a great thing. Um, so you always have to be mindful about safety with regards to the workplace, but um, since that seems to be getting better, when you're talking about bringing people back, I've seen this kind of uh, dichotomy. It's like a barbell effect where you have people on both ends and no one in the middle, where you have some groups just saying like, we're going to completely back away. Like we believe in bringing people together in certain ways, but we're just afraid to tell our employees what to do. And then you have kind of the other like carrot, carrot versus stick where the stick is like, you know, get your ass back in the office. Why? 
because like that's not a good reason. You know? Like I have a three and a half year old and one and a half year old. And when I tell them to do something because it doesn't work with them, right? Like so it's it's gonna be hard where you with with regards to talent that has a lot of optionality on where to work. Like that's uh it's not the best strategy. And then I talk to like a lot of these executive teams. And they've got really thoughtful reasons as to why they believe in their people coming back together. And very few of them are like, I need them in first thing Monday, last thing Friday, because, but there needs to be much more kind of honest dialogue and context around the why of why you believe in working together, like working as a team, caring about the development of employees, right? It's really hard to develop in isolation uh, by yourself in your house, right? Like there's a lot of really kind of pro employee reasons to help bring people back together while also being mindful about flexibility. And I think using tools that kind of consistently communicate and try to bring friction out of the employee's uh, experience on coming back to the office is important. And then I think one of the other fascinating things just in overall employee experience is the way that we operate and you touched on, we've been doing customer experience for a really long time we don't kind of sit back and like let these really long periods of time, like good companies don't let these long periods of time go in between, you know, making sure that we're servicing the customer, making sure that they're satisfied and happy. And when you look at kind of the employee experience situation right now, it's like, all right, once a year, we're going to send you this like hour long burdensome survey that even when you just think about the bias of filling out a survey, you're like, well, I have to stop and think about all these things that might've happened nine months ago or whatever. Like what we need to be doing is getting into this much kind of tighter, you know, there's ways to collect passive data on the employee experience throughout the work day and the work week that can feed in, you know, a constant feedback loop as an employee. If I had something happen to me in February and I'm filling out, you know, my, my survey in December, like the time to action on that has passed, right? So I think really starting to treat the employee like the customer service departments do, where you have these really tight KPIs and metrics on here's an issue, here's how we resolve it, right? IT departments at a lot of companies are doing this well, but IT is one tiny sliver of the overall employee experience. So I think centralizing and what you're going to start to see is more and more of this kind of central employee experience team where you're, where you're kind of actioning off of very similar KPIs to customer experience KPIs in terms of time to resolution and satisfaction and things like that, um, that I think is really exciting. And some of the best companies are, are already starting to do this. Yeah. Yeah. Excellent. Chase, it has just been a pleasure. I know at the time I'm going to have to let you go here in a minute, but this has been a fascinating conversation. We've just scratched the surface. There's so much more to say here, and I'd love to have you back anytime and we can continue the conversation before we close for today. Yeah. (laughs) Excellent. Excellent. I'll take you up on that. Uh, Before we close for today, though, I just wanted to give you a chance to share with listeners how they can connect with you, find out more about your company, your team, and then give us the final word on the topic for today. Yeah, so you can find me at Seagarb on Twitter um, and our company is HQO, so hqo.co, C-O, uh, we're a workplace experience software company. Um, and I think the, uh, the final word today is um, really putting the full life cycle of employee and employee experience first and figuring out you know, what the right tools are for their week, kind of the, the, the week in the life of an employee and being very kind of deliberate about um, driving up that employee NPS. I love it. Thank you, Chase. It's been a pleasure. I encourage listeners to reach out, to get connected, find out more about what Chase and his team can do for you. And as always, I hope everyone can stay healthy and safe, that you can find meaning and purpose at work each and every day. And I hope you all have a great week. Bluer than Indigo Leadership the journey of becoming a truly remarkable leader. Early in my adult life, I learned about an Asian proverb that translates as bluer than indigo. If you think about the color indigo, it is a brilliant, deep, and vibrant blue, what some would call the bluest of blues. To have something that is bluer than indigo is rare and truly remarkable. Contrary to popular myth, there is no one-size-fits-all or cookie-cutter approach to effective leadership. There is no silver bullet, no secret sauce, no go-to model that will solve all of your problems. 
The truth is, great leaders have all had their unique strengths and flaws, and have all had to discover and then pave their own distinctive path in their life's journey to fulfill their leadership potential. Bluer Than Indigo Leadership will help you discover your own path and explore those ordinary, everyday actions that will help you respond to an uncertain future and produce extraordinary results for individuals, teams, and organizations. Check out Human Capital Innovations magazine, Human Capital Leadership. Human Capital Leadership is a free, interactive e-magazine with the mission to help individuals, leaders, and organizations find innovative approaches to maximize their human capital potential. We publish issues quarterly in August, November, February, and May. Take a look at the latest issue and let us know what you think. alchemy of truly remarkable leadership, ordinary everyday actions that produce extraordinary results. Consider how the nature of work has shifted over the past 50 years with increased globalization, rapid technological advancement, and the shift in economic composition. The average job of today looks very different than the average job of 50 years ago. What will the jobs and organizations of tomorrow look like? Moreover, what does this all mean for organizational leaders? What are the core competencies and capabilities of organizations and their leadership that are prepared for continued disruption and geopolitical and socioeconomic shifts? Regardless of what the future holds, increasingly, leaders need to be socially minded, data driven, decisive, champions of talent, and disruptors of the traditional notions of leadership, teams, organizations, and work. The alchemy of truly remarkable leadership will help you to explore your own leadership competencies and capabilities and consider ways to apply and implement them into your workplace and personal life. Do you enjoy the Human Capital Innovations Podcast? Please subscribe, leave a review, comment, share, and consider supporting the podcast on Patreon even at the producer and sponsorship levels. Thanks again for joining us for this episode of the Human Capital Innovations Podcast. I hope you stay healthy and safe and that you have a great week.